Morning to everybody in this room. Great to see all of you this morning. Welcome to everyone joining us online. It's also great to have families coming back to the gathering. Those of you online, just to let you know, there's space for you when you're ready to come back. We're glad you're here. More and more folks getting vaccinated and people coming around and getting back in the physical gatherings week after week. And only Hunter Smith, the worship leader, could connect a green shoe to the gospel. So why would you not want to come? right, and be a part of Sunday mornings, but we're glad you're here. If you've got a Bible near you, open it up to Joshua chapter 1. We're continuing our journey through the storyline of the Bible, and I'm on to page 180, so we're rocking and rolling. It's May. We're in the month of May. We've made it to a buck 80 through the storyline, so I think by 2030 or 2031, we should be in good shape for getting towards the end, but thanks for hanging with us. I've entitled today's message, A Meteor Shower of What Ifs. It's a line from Max Lucado who said, anxiety is a meteor shower of what ifs. Anybody been staring at that sky lately? The latest researchers are saying that North Americans are reporting 53% of North Americans are reporting, are reporting a significant decline in their mental and emotional health over the last 12 months. And when I read that, I'm like, yeah, you don't need to pay a PhD researcher for that one. Just living, right, through all of this. But the psychologists and psychiatrists are bringing this up to say, as our physical realities, hopefully, you know, the, 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 at least in North America, uh, the, maybe we're in the fourth quarter of the COVID realities. Maybe we're at the two-minute warning. Our hearts and prayers go out to all of those in a country like India who are in a much different situation, and we're praying. There's Alliance churches there. There are Alliance pastors there. There are followers of Jesus trying to serve in a really difficult part of their physical realities going on in a country like that. But here in America, we're maybe fourth quarter, two-minute warning on the physical realities. But The psychologists are saying it's going to be years, if not decades, for us to experience the full ramifications of living in a global pandemic. Social distancing, restrictions, isolation, all those things, like the full ram of the full weight of that it's like a tsunami wave has come across us physically, and we'll be dealing with the emotional and mental debris for years which is why I want us to think about what do we do with this bully called fear in our lives that seems to have risen up and pushing us around more than ever this past 15 months or so. And I want to give you an image for the day that I want you to think about if you had a giant fear magnet that you could place over your heart, a giant fear magnet. And if it could, in a moment's time, extract out every shrapnel of anxiety and uncertainty and doubt, if it could just extract it out, like if it could just lift the tension across your shoulders, if it could remove like the the shortness in your breath, if it could take the, the pit or the knot in your stomach away, if it could stop that loop of thoughts, that that loop that just keeps circling over and over and over. If in a moment's time, a magnet could just extract that off of our lives, just lift it from our lives. Can you imagine that moment? I've been watching a a mini-series called The Chosen on the Life of Jesus. Anybody been watching The Chosen? Hands up if you've been seeing anything on The Chosen. I commend it to you. You have to download the app called The Chosen. It's a mini-series on the life of Jesus. I think it's very well done. They had some really important scholars involved. I think they've done a great job with the storyline, the actors, the actresses. It's just, I think it's been exceptional. And so I've been personally, over the last couple months, I've been watching it and then had the Simpson family join in last night. We started through episode one and two. I've gotten through all season one. I'm just into season two But here's a couple of personal takeaways from The Chosen, this profile of the life of Jesus, kind of take the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the biographers, and just say, how would you kind of put yourself in first century Palestine? Here's what's been one kind of overwhelming reality is just how physically hard it was for people to live everyday life in first century Palestine. 
It's hard in 21st century America to put ourselves physically there. I think this series does a good job of putting you there. And just the the political realities, along with the religious realities, along with the social realities, along with just the kind of physical hardship of just trying to exist every day. Food, water, shelter, clothing, like it's just the, the physical environment that those first century followers of Jesus were living in. I just, it just hit me in a fresh way. It's just really hard. Combined with this, that I think the actor they chose for Jesus just, is just outstanding. And the humanity of Jesus has just kind of hit me in a fresh way. That Jesus, he's just portrayed entering in honestly to the sufferings and pain of everyday life in first century Palestine. To me, that's really clear. He's entering into the sufferings, yet simultaneously seems to be free from this bully called fear. He seems to be looking beyond this meteor shower of what ifs. Like there's this freedom. In the language of Matthew 11, it says that when we're yoked to Jesus, we experience a yoke that is easy and a burden that is light. That there's something about Jesus keeping his feet grounded in physical reality, seeing it honestly for what it is, painful and difficult and chaotic. I mean, really challenging circumstances that they're all living in, and he's living in it with them. Yet the eyes of his soul are fixed on a kingdom that's not of this world. And there's just a beautiful freedom that he's portrayed in his countenance and his interaction. And I found myself just often saying, man, I want more of that. Like what, what Jesus, when he steps into that chaos and to that suffering and to that hardship, and he, he steps into it with honesty and, and a freedom and a gaze of his soul that's fixed beyond this. Every, anybody else interested in that? And I found myself thinking about that as we turn to where the Israelites find themselves in Joshua chapter 1. Because in Joshua chapter 1, remember where the Israelites are now. I put a little map together. Here's geographically where they are. In in Joshua chapter 1, remember Moses has passed on. Remember, Moses is the beloved leader, the well, well-worn, well-respected. He around 120 years old. He had led the Israelites up to this spot near in the promised land, the Dead Sea over there on the right-hand side. Moses led him up there. Forty years ago, they had come up to this place, and they had wanted, they said, hey, it's time to take possession of the land. And remember, they sent the spies in, and, and ten of the spies came back and said, you know what? The people there, there's a lot of ites. Hittites, Jebusites, Perizzites, Canaanites, all these ites, they're about as welcoming to us in the first century as the North Korean regime is to visitors in the 21st century. Like you don't just book a ticket to North Korea these days. Same kind of deal there. And they're so numerous, like there's not a lot of social distancing options in the promised land. They're, they're densely populated, they're, there's a lot of them, they're big, they're intimidating, they're not welcoming. So the, the 10 of the 12 spies come back and tell Moses, the circumstances are too overwhelming, the meteor shower, just way too many what ifs and what abouts, no, no way we're going in. Let's turn around and go back. Not the finest like faith-filled moment for the Israelites. And I spent 40 years spooling, spiraling around in the desert. And so their well-loved, well-worn leader, Moses, <laughs> has just passed on and passed the baton to this guy named Joshua, and they're back here at the same physical piece of ground, at the same spot. And here's where Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is eight. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. So you see, God's still on plan A. 
which is, aren't you encouraged? Like, there's only one sovereign Lord. There's only one capital S sovereign. And when you're sovereign, you don't have to shout. You can just say, this is it. This settles it. We're going to keep moving forward. Even though 40 years ago, we were right here. I'm guessing the circumstances don't look much different, certainly not better 40 years later. Do you picture like the Perizzites and Canaanites and Hittites, like less populated 40 years later? <laughs> you feel like a little more warm and welcoming to the Israelites? For No, it's probably 40 years worse than it was before. And God says, we're going to go and take possession of the promised land. That's always been plan A. Why wait 40 years? Well, he had to let the whole generation die off, all of them, except for Caleb and Joshua. And now the baton goes. Can you, can, you feel, can you feel this tsunami of fear and anxiety that has to be a part of this Israelite group? Like knowing their ancestors, the previous generation, the stories they would have heard. And now the baton, Moses is gone and it goes to Joshua. And here's, here's Joshua's like resume. His first 40 years of his life, he was a slave in Egypt. That's zero to 40. 40 to 80 He's wandering the desert with all of them in the desert. At eight, so he now gets the baton at 80, and from 80 to 105, he leads the Israelites. Do you see that? Like, so those of you pushing into your 60s and 70s, hey, look, you're just stepping into your prime right here according to the Bible storyline. Come on. Moses gets the baton at 80 to lead. Joshua gets the baton at 80 to lead. Moses has his most fruitful years from 80 to 120. Joshua has his from 80 to 105. That tells me as a devoted and committed as we are around here, investing in the next generation, which we need to continue to be, we also need to invest and look at of deploying the generation that's before us. If you're not dead, you're not done is kind of the idea, right? If God's given you breath of life in your lungs, it's not to go collect seashells in the Gulf of Mexico. It's to, right? It's to say, hey, Lord, what do you want me to do? You got a baton for me to pass? Where am I ready to go? And you might be getting up there in years. I think you have perhaps more to offer now in kingdom leadership than you've ever had in your life. I commend to you Joshua. Who, by the way, little parentheses on this morning. If you need a good character study on how do you deal with coming through being on the receiving end of the sin of others, some of you are going through circumstances in your life that mainly it's the sinful choices of others that thrust you into some realities that you just, it's a battle in your own heart to stay in a good posture of grace and forgiveness and love and compassion towards those that seem to be inflicting sinful choices upon you. I want to commend to you Joshua and Caleb, those two men right there. For 40 years, they take a desert trek, primarily at the sin of of all their friends and family around them. Think about that. They were the two guys who said, I don't care how many ites are in the land. I don't care how big and intimidating it look. I, I don't care what that looks like there. We're, we need to go because the Lord said go. But they were outnumbered. There were 10 other spies and they rallied the troops and they convinced everybody to turn around and go back. For 40 years, they lived in that reality and seems for me from the Scripture, I see that they seem to have came through it in a, in a really healthy way, that they still love people. They didn't get jaded or cynical and judgmental, hard-hearted. And how easy it is, right, when we're on the receiving end of sinful cha choices and actions. Like, you can just get jaded and cynical and push people away and just be done. Like, he, the last thing someone like Joshua and Caleb might want to do is step forward and, and lead into the very space that the last time they were there led them 40 years in the desert burning sand. But here they are. And somehow with God's grace, they were able to, to nab. It shows me it's possible to encourage those of you who are in that setting. And so the baton's handed to Joshua, and the commission is still the same, go and possess the land. And now with the ingredients being as the meteor shower being as bright as it's ever been, the tsunami wave being as strong, the bully of fear pushing in. Notice what the Lord says to him, six to nine, kind of the core verses for today. Well, the promise in verse five, here's what he, he promises them. He says, hey, by the way, he tells the group, as surely as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I won't leave you and I won't forsake you. That's the promise. God says, I promise I'll be with you. That's key. We'll come back to that. And then he gives them this command. Be strong, verse six, and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. 
Be strong and very courageous. I want you to underline, if you've got your Bibles, underline all the ways, all the times he says this. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. And he adds this line, do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So do you see? You see the promise? God's promise is this, I will be with you, just like I was with Moses. Remember pillar of fire, pillar of cloud, remember that? Just as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. That's the promise. And then the command is, be strong, be courageous, ground yourself in my word. So the command, I'll be with you. The commission, take the land, the promise. And, now the, and then the command is, hey, be strong, be courageous, ground yourself in my word. Does it sound a little bit familiar than Moses' closing sermon in Deuteronomy 30 from last week, the spirituality of choice? It sounds like God's just kind of reiterating what Moses said, right? You got a fork in the road, you've got life and prosperity on one fork, you got death and destruction, you got a free will to choose, and now God says, hey, you've got the promised land before you, you've got all kinds of circumstances, I know they look large, I know they look intimidating, 40 years later, circumstances probably haven't changed a lot, circumstances actually might have gotten a little bit worse, so what's different now? What do you think is different now for Joshua and the Israelites? Having gone through what they've gone through, him going from year 40 to year 80, I think for Joshua, I think for Caleb, I think for the Israelite leaders, the circumstances around them didn't change in any measurable way. But what did change was their vision of the God that was with them. The God who has said, I will be with you, has gotten bigger in their eyes. And hear this, church, the bigger God gets in our eyes, the clearer we become on who is with us, it right-sizes and frames the circumstances we're staring at. To say it another way in the language of Romans 8, Paul said it this way in Romans 8, says, if God be for you, who can stand against you? That's Paul's way of saying, get real clear on who is for you and who is with you, and that'll help frame all that's coming against you. Are you tracking with me? I think that's what's different for Joshua and the Israelites right now. On the bank, the same piece of ground, the same circumstances. Forty years later, I think there's an expanded view and an expanded vision for who God is and the glory and majesty that all he's displayed in this journey to this point. And so do you see why it's important? He says, so hey, be strong, be courageous, and hey, ground yourself in this God-breathed book. So when he says there, the book of the law, that's Old Testament speak for the Bible at that point. The book of law, the first five books of the Old Testament is all they had, the books of Moses at that point. Hey, make sure you're keeping the people grounded in what you've been living through because we have a tendency to forget. We edit history. We selectively remove it. We just, I know, I, I just forget. And God can kind of get, it gets a little bit smaller in my eyes. And so he says, make sure you keep the Word of God before them. That's why we hear, why we're reading through the Scriptures and we're plowing our way through this storyline and we're going to keep doing it year after year. Why? Why do we do that in children's ministry and student ministry? Why today after, after church, there's a group of fourth graders getting together with Kim and Brad and they're doing Bible basics to prepare, prepare them for student ministry. Why? Why is that so important? Because of this. Hey, Joshua, hey, the Israelites, you've got to remember. Do you remember? Keep this book of the law before him because then you're going to remember stories like, do you remember when Abraham and Sarah, you remember when they couldn't have a child? You remember how they handled that? You remember when they took things into their own hands? Remember the Ishmael story? It's like, oh, yeah, I remember that. And you remember they waited at 25 years, and you remember Sarah was done, and she laughs at the Lord when the Lord came to her and said, you're going to have a baby in nine months, and she laughed at him. And then nine months later, Isaac's born. Do you remember that? You got to remember those stories. Joshua, do you remember what that was like? And do you remember then when God told Abraham to take him up Mount Moriah and lay him down and didn't understand why and where and what. Do you remember the ram that came in the thicket and the Lord said he'll provide? Do you remember that? That Abraham and Isaac came down from the mountain 
and things began to shift and they were different. And do you remember when Jacob and his whole family ran out of food? They were in Israel. They were in the promised land. How do we get down here in Egypt in the first place? Got to tell the story. Do you remember how we got to Egypt? We were out of food. We were going to starve to death. There was a famine up in the promised land in the land of Canaan. And so they go, last ditch effort. Let's go down to Egypt, see if we can get some food. And when they got down there, who's in charge of the food supply? Joseph, shocker, right? Spoiler alert for the whole family. Jacob thought Joseph was dead. And here, Jacob is brother. Joseph's like VP of agriculture in the land of Egypt. Remember that? You got you to tell that story. That's how we got to Egypt. And do you remember, like, we were welcomed guests at one point in Egypt. Remember that? And then it shifted, and we became enslaved laborers. And remember Moses? Do you remember they were killing all the boys, all the Hebrew boys that were born? And remember those midwives that saved some of the Hebrew boys? You remember they put him in a little basket? Remember he got rescued, and he, and he grew up? Do you remember Moses, the burning bush? Do you remember that? And you remember when we got to the Red Sea and Moses stood up and the Egyptian army was coming after us, Pharaoh had finally released his grips and then said, no, I'm going to second, I'm coming after you. And it was an uncrossable body of water here and it was an Egyptian army there. What happened? Remember, remember, Moses stretched out and the Lord parted the waters and we crossed and then the body of water washed the Egyptian army away. Do you remember? Do you remember Sinai? And Moses goes up Sinai and the glory of God descends, and he, and he gives us the tablets. Do you remember? And then do you remember the golden calf? I better not forget the golden calf. Better read that one two or three times. Because you got impatient, and you started making gods in your own eyes. Take it into your own hands. Do it in your own strength. Do you remember that? And you remember when Moses came down, his face was so radiant, you couldn't hardly look into it. Remember that? See, the more we ground ourselves in this God-breathed book, what happens, church? We remember, we get a larger vision and picture of who is with us. This God who says, I will be with you. And the bigger he gets in our eyes, the more it reframes and right-sizes the circumstances. It's not that the circumstances are going to, in some significant way, shift. Most of the storyline for the Israelites has been circumstantial chaos, circumstantially overwhelming, a meteor shower of what ifs. They had more to be anxious about and let the bully of fear run over their hearts than probably any group of people living at that time had. But they also had this. Yahweh said, I'll be with this group. I'll be with them. In a Romans 8 language, (laughs) if God be for you, what can be against you? And in that, I think there's some way, he gives us a vision. It's like this magnet rolling over our heart that can extract this fear and this anxiety and certain, extract it from the weight that it feels on our shoulders. How is that possible? I think it's this picture, right? You be strong, you be courageous, and you make sure and be grounded in this God-breathed book. And I know for many of you, this past year, I mean, that meteor shower has been overwhelmingly intimidating. You've been, that bully of fear has been having its day in the hallways of your heart, just like mine. I I mean, I've been, I've been battling just like you guys, right? I've been, three things I've really been struggling for the last 15 minutes, been struggling with being fatigued, discouraged, and overwhelmed for me. Fatigued, discouraged, and overwhelmed. For those of you who have been around Eagle for a lot of years, I and mean, we've had a lot of, I mean, we've had a lot of history together, 25 plus years together of just, I mean, we've had amazing moments together, right? Mountaintop celebrations, and we've had gut-wrenching valleys together. We've laughed together. We've cried together. I mean, we've been through a lot together. We've been through a lot of years or where it was clearer than ever where God wanted us to go and what He wanted us to be about, and, and we've been through stretches where we're just like scratching our head going, well, I have no idea what God's doing and where He's taking us. And what, I mean, there, and everything in between. And several of you this year have, have contacted me through the year, and you've talked about how you weren't, quite, you weren't quite sure what to do with all the quiet space you've been given and kind of the slowed down schedule and the change of pace, so many of you live life on the road and your road schedule just stopped. Like you went from traveling four or five days a week to none. You went from commuting to no commute. You went from kids' sports schedule to no kids' sports. I mean, like life came to us a screeching halt on so many fronts. And, 
And I'm so glad so many of you had a, a slowed down, kind of a change of pace schedule. That has not been the case for me personally, and I know for some of the rest of you in other positions in your own areas of work, but this has been, candidly, the busiest 15 months of my pastoral life. I cannot recall a busy… If there has been one, then selective memory then. I can't recall it. I've been stretched to the edges of my leadership capacity like at no other time in my life. And it's just the multi-layered chaos that we're all… It's the, it's the height and breadth and brightness of the meteor shower that's just we're constantly and perpetually living under. It's like my old, uh, my old bowling buddy used to say to me, we'd be bowling, it'd be late at night, and the guys, you know, in a bowling league, later at night, you know, it gets a little rowdy and rough. And so he'd say to me, he'd put his arm around me as we're wrapping up the night, and he'd say, Rev, look around, job security. <laughs> it's kind of felt that way, you know, just the, the sheer volume of human need this past 15 months. Does anybody feel the weight of that? And I've just felt it. Just human need. Neediness of my own heart and just the brokenness and chaos of our world. And, and just candidly, like, no matter how much I've prayed or how much I've sought the counsel of others or how much I've waited on the Lord for things, like, circumstantially, things just haven't gotten much better of all. They basically get worse. And, and guess what? In leadership positions at times, like you got to make decisions no matter how long you wait or how much you pray or how much counsel you receive. You got to make some decisions. Like you're not, you don't get the luxury of just, oh, let's punt that one down the field. And then I've just been faced with so many different situations where no matter what decision you make here, there's going to be a group or groups of people frustrated and disappointed at your decision. It just... There's no pathway forward in light of our current circumstances where there's kind of a collective unity of spirit and oneness of heart around things. We're really struggling with that just culturally right now, and it's kind of manifests itself. And the cumulative effect of all of that has been, man, I've just gotten really fatigued and discouraged and overwhelmed to the point where, man, this bully of fear is kind of having a field day with me. It gets me to kind of lead from my heels and not from my toes, it gets me to want to shrink back, to be like the 10 spies and go, yeah, I know what the Lord's asking us to do. I know where we need to go with this, but man, those ites look big and intimidating. And do I really want to deal with that mess that's going to create? Maybe we just, let's take another lap around the desert. I mean, the 10 spies, I can, or I'm picturing like all the Israelites, like families lining up on the banks of the J Jordan River. You ever picture that? Those of you who visited the Holy Land, like you sit along the banks of the Jordan River and I can see them all there and they're looking across the Jordan into the promised land. And I could see them glancing at each other and glancing up at Joshua and going, seriously? Like, seriously? We're going to do that? I'm good. I'm good. That! And just kind of month after month of that, where you could just kind of feel it, right? Where just the, it just pushes and it shoves you to places, and it gets you to shrink back, and, and I've needed more than ever to just, and perhaps you need it this morning, I don't know, I, I just needed more than ever to say, God, I just need to get a clear and expanded vision of who's with me, who's with us. God, I need you to get a little bit bigger in my eyes. I need the gaze of my soul to be like what Jesus manifests in the chosen there. I need a little bit of that, that he could step into the chaos and the mess and live with such great freedom and confidence like that. How does that happen? I think there's this magnet that rolls across our heart that can extract out, and I don't mean it all today, to diminish what I know for some of you is a physiological reality. I know some of you have mental health struggles and anxiety disorders to the point where there's definitely physiological realities, and I empathize with you. But what I'm positioning to you today is I think there's some spiritual realities that help frame our physiological and physical realities on this issue. I don't think Joshua and the Israelites had diagnoses like PTSD back then. I don't think they had ADHD back then. I don't think they lacked for all of that running through the camp. 
They had PTSD, they had ADHD, they had all kinds of anxiety disorders, they had sleepless nights, sleep disorders, they had all of it because the meteor shower was overwhelming and the bully of fear was so loud. What was the solution? He said, you got to lift up your eyes and get a vision that if God be for you, then what can stand against you? There needs to be an impartation of courage from the Holy Spirit that comes when you lift your eyes up off your circumstances and see The God who is with us in Jesus says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. I know you don't understand. I know it's confusing. It doesn't mean you're just supernaturally like not fatigued or not overwhelmed. It's that you, you're bringing, you're bringing that exhaustion. You're bringing that state of just circumstantial chaos. You're bringing that underneath a larger reality. The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joshua. He says, I'll be with you, and I will help you. That was the promise. God said, I'll be with you, and the command was, be strong, be courageous, and ground yourself in my word. And I think the net effect was this. I I suspect Joshua may have offered some type of sermon or some type of regular reflection for the troops That was this. I call it the new math of grace. God plus anybody equals a majority. That's what he's trying to sell. He says, I I know you look overwhelmed. I know it looks intimidated. I know that they way outnumber us. And I know circumstantially it doesn't make a lot of sense. But here's what also I know. I know that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. I know that the Lord is the one who stands before us, the pillar of fire and pillar of cloud. I know that if God is for us, then nothing's going to stand against us. And that God says, get yourselves ready, pack up your bags. We are crossing the Jordan and we're taking the land. So God plus anybody equals a majority. You're the anybody. We're the anybody right now. And I know for me these days, that's a word I need to hear. How about for you? How about for us? Worship team, why don't you come on back up? We're going to transition to a time of communion. And uh, I found myself all through this year kind of probably a year more than the last 15 months, probably exercising my spiritual disciplines more deeply than ever in my life, probably trying to stay more devoted and immersing myself here than ever and my mind racing. My mind's been like, you know, like, you remember the old commercials where it's like the lotto ping pong balls, like the lotto machine ping pong, and they're drawing out like the power balls and all that? That's the way I felt like my prayer life, my mind's been with my prayer life. It's just this array of ping pong balls just going off like crazy and just saying morning by morning, day by day, open this word, get on my knees, bring my ping pong ball praying mind and heart before the Lord. And it's a line like out of Isaiah 50. I've been anchored in this one for a while. Isaiah 54 and 5 says, the sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by warning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The sovereign Lord's opened my ears. I've not been rebellious. I've not drawn back. That, Lord. If just a measure of that could be said in the midst of all of this, that's what I'm clinging to. And so, church, as we go to the communion table this morning, here, here's what I want to offer to you. Look up here. I want to offer this as the magnet of fear across your heart this morning. This fear magnet. I want to offer this to extract every shrapnel that you come in here carrying. Some of you have been staring at circumstances. I don't understand why they continue to loop around what they're looking I don't know. I've said I don't know more in the last year and a half than I've said in my whole life. Probably going to say it the rest of the time. I don't know. But here's what I do know. These elements right here. This is the guarantee of what God told Joshua. As surely as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. Do you want a picture of how much God said, hey, here's how I'll be with you. Ultimately in His Son, giving his body, shedding his blood to be with us, to come across our hearts 
to reframe the meteor shower and to say, maybe today, church, this Jesus is get a little bit bigger in our eyes. To recognize who is for you, who is with you, who is able. Even if the circumstances don't markedly change, perhaps we in them could. I suspect that's what for Joshua was the case. And so if you didn't pick these up on the way in, this is the way we're doing communion these days. Someday we'll get back to the old ways of doing communion, but this is as good as we've got today with the COVID realities we have. And so there's some gluten-free options at the table in the back. If you missed it on the way in in just a moment, after I pray, you can get up and go back and grab those. And then I'm just going to lead us in a brief prayer in a moment, just give you a little time in your own heart to settle and center yourself on this act of worship. And then the team's going to lead us in, a, I think, a beautiful song that'll help us meditate even more and reflect on it. But you don't have to be a member of Eagle to participate in communion here. Um, you don't even have to be a regular attender. But the scriptures are clear. You need to be a follower of Jesus. Your heart's intent needs to be, hey, I want to honor the Lord, live for Him, confess my sin, believe in His heart, that He's been raised from the dead, that He died on a cross, that. And if that's not been true for you, today, you can pray that prayer. Give your heart to Jesus and take communion for the first time. That can happen for you today. And then for those of you who do know the Lord, I want to encourage you. Take these few moments and let this magnet extract out of here what it needs to extract out. Imagine just for a moment, imagine him just lifting some of that weight that you've been carrying in here and reframing some of the reality you've been staring at out there. Let's pray together. If there's anyone here or listening online and today's a day where you just say you want to confess your sin and give your heart to Christ for the first time in your life, then you just pray in the quietness of your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, save me. Forgive me. I know I've messed up, fallen on my face, tried to do things in my own wisdom and strength. I just confess it to you, Jesus. I need a Savior. Come, forgive me. Fill me with your Spirit. Lead me. I want to take these communion elements as an act of worship for the first time today. And then for others of you that have done that, you're here as a follower of Jesus, and man, you've been battling like I've been battling. You've been battling that bully of fear. You say, it's enough, it's enough. He's tired of him pushing, pushing me around. Just right now, just kind of open up that exhaustion, open up that overwhelmed circumstance, open up that uncertainty and just say, Jesus, help. Breathe your courage. Breathe your strength. Help the gaze of my, the eyes of my soul, would they become enlightened right now to see the glory of the God who is with us and for us and able. God, just get a little bit bigger in our eyes today, I pray. Thank you for this representation of your broken body and shed blood. Thank you, it's such a picture of this, I will be with you. And we literally now get to internalize physically this reality that you are with us. We take these elements as an act of worship now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.